again. So um, today is the final day of the class. And again, it um, pains me to see the loss of opportunities to um, advance you on your learning journey uh, with uh, system science. Covered a lot of material in this course. Um, and we've covered material uh, that takes uh, a certain stance with respect to opportunities for learning um, that seeks to learn more quickly, more reliably, more robustly uh, about the world by learning, by reasoning about underlying uh, drivers for systems. And it's not that we build models that are guaranteed correct, um, but it's in fact uh, by taking some stab at it, some, some attempt to formulate understanding behind the factors governing phenomena we notice in the world uh, that we find when our cherished understandings of the world uh, fall short of explaining um, uh, the phenomena we're seeking to explain. It's by um, attempting um, to explain things uh, in a in a precise, unambiguous way, that we find those precise, unambiguous explanations fall short of accounting for for what's observed. Uh, it's it's by failing early that we learn early. Fail early, fail often. Fail forward. Uh, we learn by trying something. As Francis Bacon said, and I've quoted to you this before, although not in the original Latin, one more quickly comes to truth through error than from confusion. But I want to talk today about a, a certain aspect of, of system science of particular importance. And it has to do with the engagement of system science with evidence from the world, evidence that's increasingly available to us um, in, in um, um, richer and richer fashions, more high, high velocity fashions. Um, and specifically, I wanna speak about the encounter of system science with data science. And the fact that this encounter, uh, this bring together the system science perspective with the tools, the the formalisms, the the computational uh, infrastructures, and the big data associated with data science, are set to 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 transform data system science into something that I believe is greater, appropriately enough, than the sum of its parts. What I like to call systems data science, which is neither reducible to system science nor to data science. And one of the inspiring quotes behind this um, is a strongly held opinion, which you know I, I have some reservations on, um, but but points to some effective um, um, perspective. Um, and it's about moving beyond both myth and madness in our work. And and the comment from epidemiologist Phil Zuckerman was that. Theory without data is myth. Mere myth. And data without theory, to explain it, to understand it, is madness. And we're talking here in the systems data science context about moving beyond myth and madness. And we're talking about bringing together two rich, powerful, fast advancing traditions. On the one hand, the focus of the course, system science, the science of a whole, the science of understanding, and helping to manage in many cases, the behavior of dynamically complex systems. These systems where their evolution depends on the current state, and which often exhibit behavior not merely reducible to any one part, but rather emergent behavior. Um, behavior that defies often 
ready um, uh, intuitive understanding, sometimes counterintuitive uh, Plano. That's system science on the left. And then the other tradition being brought together, the other set of methods and tools and infrastructures and skill sets, et cetera, lenses, is data science, which is really about gaining insight into the world through analysis of empirical data using computational methods. And, and this is a tradition, uh, then even more so than system science, although it's a prominent feature there, it focuses on empirical evidence. Um, uh, and it's not that it, it denies or uh, uh, entirely ignores understanding that of the underlying processes that give rise to data, but the attention traditionally has not been on that. And it really seeks here to, to take uh, evidence from the world in the form of, of data, um, often quantitative, but not always, and, and learn from that. And uh, sometimes uh, people are proud that, that their analysis is not, um, uh, always theory-based. So we're dealing with a complex landscape here, um, a landscape in which uh, we have a variety of tools which are often um, themselves uh, the subject of huge amount of attention, huge amount of attention, huge amount of hype, huge amount of, of uh, discussion that are interwoven, interdependent, and synergistic in many cases in multiple ways. Well, one feeds the other and vice versa um, in, in ways that are very powerful. Uh, we have uh, the broader enterprise of data science uh, enabled through artificial intelligence um, and particularly through the machine learning sub area of artificial intelligence, which is used by many other areas of artificial intelligence, a bit further removed from the details of the scores like automated reasoning or robotics or path planning and, and, and spoken language recognition. But where machine learning provides this set of, of core methods aiming to, to have deeper and deeper learning and more powerful understanding enabled as, as more and more data is available. And it comes in a variety of, of different incarnations, probabilistic learning, uh, learning based on Bayesian methods, uh, kernel methods or older connectionist methods have been around since the 60s, but are in their third big peak right now with things like uh, deep learning and, um, and, and deeper uh, neural networks uh, uh, and reinforcement learning. And we have data science, uh, this which provides principles, practices, tools, infrastructures to enable handling of data at scale and particularly big data. Data which um, we'll be talking about, but which is characterized by the four Bs, high velocity, high volume, that's the big as in big data, but also high variety and, and often high veracity. So I'd like to, give you a bit of a glimpse of some tools of systems data science. And some of these you will recognize, some we've actually covered, although we didn't label them as such, like calibration, for example. And some bit in the background, like parameter estimation. But we talk about some others, and some others taking this in new directions. One thing we talked about, which is actually quite the the net the the origin of uh, genesis of many services a root of many many powerful um, elements of system science uh, systems data science insight is this concept of a state space a phase space that we uh, we given uh, we talked about right and where we can reason about the behavior of a system not only in disconnected curves over time of state variables but we can reason about how its state evolves in some abstract state, in some abstract space, where at any given time, the system is at a particular state, and where that state evolves over time within this construct, within this 
volume that we think of as characterizing different aspects of its state. And in one of our final lectures, um, we, we discussed, or one of our final discussions in person, we discussed briefly how data is related to this and how by taking data from the world and systematically plotting values out over time for the same measurements, you not only get sort of interesting geometric patterns that might allow you to kind of follow them forward and guess where they might be going. Uh, but more than that, you get a picture of, and I, I don't have a, a slide on, but you get what you get is a is a picture of uh, the underlying state space. You get um, a depiction of something that is kind of a squeeze stretched version of the underlying state space geometry. So it gives you a window that's not dependent on a given model from data that speaks to us about the underlying state space of the system out there in the world and can clue us in to aspects of uh, the system that's given, that's driving. Now, uh, we've also talked in this class about some features of that state space, the fact that it may have different basins of attraction, where, where in, in one area of the state space, if you start here or emerge to a place here, you may flow into this basin of attraction, which, which is not shown uh, fully, but you can imagine it going to some sort of equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium limit cycle, maybe further up. Whereas if you're in this region, it, it cycles down to here. And the, the point is we have a structured method and I discussed it with you, it's in delayed embedding. And if I'm not mistaken, there may be a slide on it later as we talk about um, the CCM technique, which provides this way of taking sets of data and placing them in this, in this reconstructed state space which can allow us to reason about these basins of attraction and can allow us to, um, to understand something about uh, the structure of the state space. I'm, I'm hearing um, some, uh, some notifications go off and I'm not sure if that's from someone else's, uh, uh, someone else's machine. It doesn't seem to be from a chat. For the next, next set of uh, methods, I want to talk about, this is unfortunate, um, there's some work, I guess, going on here, and we'll have to bear with it. Uh, a set of, set of further approaches in the system science canon, which uh, are based on filtering and inference methods um, for for dynamical systems. These two are aspects of systems data science because they involve um, taking rich data and, and using that to inform our system science models, our dynamical systems models. And these come in broadly um, a spectrum of methods that can be divided according to this Venn diagram into one of a of a set of relationships. So, so there, they may be, or a set of, um, a set of uh, different spheres of, of of methods. On the one hand, we have parameter inference techniques. These are techniques that seek to arrive at estimates of particular model parameters. You're familiar with that concept from 394, I hope. Whether it's things like contact rate or probability that someone will be infected given exposure recovery rate or time, mean time to lose immunity or what have you. Um, often our models to be theories of the world um, that are unambiguous enough to be simulated, they need estimates of certain parameters. And we talked about the impact of variability in those estimates. It's not always the mean we're interested in, but 
regardless of these things, we, we have to arrive at, if, if we want to ground these in evidence, we have to arrive at a way to infer them from, from data. And it turns out that there's uh, a wide variety of methods for doing so. Some of them involve simple turning to analyses that others have conducted or turning to data sets where um, some factor related to this parameter from which it can be more or less computed directly. And sometimes we reuse estimates from other models. Um, and sometimes they're estimates and things like uh, experimental studies in, in health. It's, it may be randomized controlled trials of certain sorts that are lucky enough to measure something um, uh, directly. We may have reports from the literature on how long it took um, for people to recover from a certain symptom, et cetera. And we could perform direct parameter estimation. But often we end up using more sophisticated methods. And one of them that we've talked quite a bit about, of course, is calibration. And in calibration, we're doing something that for, for non-system science models is, is not really possible. We're taking data from the world, or often it's not possible. We're taking data from the world that's not only about that parameter, but rather it's data about the emergent behavior of a system more generally. Um, it's data from the world that's that's observed, and it's it may be affected by a quantity of interest, a parameter of instance, interest, a contact rate, for example, or the recovery rate, but it's affected by a lot of different things. If we look at the number of active cases of COVID-19 in the world at a given time, is it affected by the contact rate? You bet it is. Is it affected by the recovery rate? Yeah. Because it's the number of people who still have COVID-19 in the world. And if it was super fast recovery, there'd be fewer of them. Is it affected by how long it takes for people to lose immunity? Yeah, you bet it is, because some of these may be reinfections. Uh, of people who had lost immunity from earlier? Is it affected by the likelihood that a given case will be reported? Of course. So it's it's, an, it's affected by a lot of these factors and by the dynamics of the system, right? The, and the recovery process and the, the new diagnosis process and the reporting process. So all those things are tangled up, but calibration lets us if it's a particularly simple, and some would argue sometimes the way it's used is simplistic, a way of, of dealing with these kind of data uh, gradients where we we have data about some, about the behavior of a system um, that is not directly about any one parameter, but uh, a broad, broad system behavior. And we try to, adjust our assumptions about less well-known areas of the system so that we can best match that data, best accord with it, right? We, we, can, we can best align with it. So we may have data on many features of a, of a system. We're, only, we're adjusting our assumptions about parameters we don't know so that it simultaneously accounts for, it accords with, it's consistent with, it aligns with all these different types of data. And you'll sometimes hear a glib remark, a throwaway remark made by people either out of ignorance or out of, and typically it's that, or out of, um, you know, ill will, um, uh, that says, well, a model can match anything if you just tweak the parameter values. You know, a model, model doesn't involve um, uh, anything really solid. I mean, if you tweak the parameter values, you can, you can match anything in the world. And that's not at all true. And I hope, I would hope your experience in this course would help you realize that model structure 
shapes model behavior, constrains model behaviors in ways that are at least as much and typically much more significant yet than parameter values. Parameter values do matter, whether an extinction takes off or not, whether the basic reproductive number is greater than one or less than one, is, is affected by parameters in important ways. But it's often the structure of the model that fundamentally determines what behaviors are possible, what modes of behavior is possible, are cycles possible. You know, if we have an SIR model with no loss of immunity, there are certain invariants, right? Susceptibles will never go up, never rise. There's no inflow and all there is is, is outflow. Either it stays the same or goes down. Recoveries will always stay the same or go up, right? They're, these are structural features of the situation. And other features determine, you know, are cycles possible or is exponential growth possible, et cetera. And calibration takes into account those constraints of the model, model structure, and asks if you adjust parameters, can you accord simultaneously with these sets of data? And sometimes you, you find you can, and sometimes you find you can't, and that's not a failure of modeling, it's a success of learning, because you, you learn, you're learning something. Maybe you learn it's a problem with the data, maybe you learn it's a problem with your model assumptions, but you've you've failed forward um, by by learning from it. Um, and uh, as you're aware, we here we're dealing with like with state space with a, a certain abstract space, but it's a, it's not state space. We're dealing with parameter space. As we adjust parameters, we try to find with calibration the best match within this parameter space, the single point where the system best accords with observed data. Or we find that we can't find an adequate match and we've learned something, right? Now, calibration is great, but it has a number of key limitations. A single point estimates give no sense of, of variability or uncertainty along it. Maybe there's many places within that parameter space where it matches equally well or really well. Um, there's pretty strong limitations often, including that, you know, it's best in a single region of the space. And and there's there's some other technical technical constraints, including that we're typically assuming a certain model structure. And these other methods will often will relax many of these assumptions. One of the more straightforward ones is something called approximate Bayesian computation, which is inspired by Bayesian probability techniques. Maybe some of you have gone further in your math and stats, have seen the, the power of Bayesian techniques. If you want to learn about data science, it's your key priority because Bayesian techniques have a very very pragmatic and excellent fit to learning over time from the world, learning as new data comes in, updating our estimates. Um, and approximate Bayesian computation is inspired by those techniques, but um, is, is one that um, is approximate. It's, it's not exactly a, a, a Bayesian technique. Um, but uh, we seek to arrive at something that's called a, a, a posterior distribution um, uh, that reflects not only our initial assumptions or prior, but a uh, but uh, updated understanding from the model. And it tries to give you a, a distribution of values, a posterior distribution of values over uh, the the parameter values. Um, and it's a particularly simple technique where we often simply accept or reject possible parameter values. And um, we are we are then uh, treating those as, as samples from a sort of uh, uh, plausible parameter uh, parameter values within our posterior distribution. 
Um, so we're, we're considering the fact that there may not just be one value that maximizes this. There may be different values. Maybe it's a really broad set of possibilities, or maybe it's a very narrow set. And approximate Bayesian computation is a particularly simplistic way of, of sort of trying to narrow down, you know, or trying to figure out how narrow is that uh, interpretation, how narrow is, is the set of possibilities. Um, and that's this. So theta here is the parameters, and, and we're trying to assess this, what's called a conditional probability distribution. You may recognize it from your stats and probability and stats courses, right? Um, so given the observed data, that's why, that's how we traditionally write observed data, we're, we're, we're trying to estimate this probability distribution over different values of some thetas. The thetas are the parameters. So there may be some values of parameters, combinations of parameters, which are very unlikely, and some which are... Uh, which are very likely, um, maybe many, which are very likely, and and we're we're trying to understand which combination, what what values of those parameters. Maybe it's contact rate be this, transmission rate be that, recovery time be that, lost immunity time be that. These kind of vectors of of numbers. Maybe it has three values in it. This vector for different parameters. Maybe it's four. We're trying to figure out which of those are plausible and which are not in light of the data. And this is a particularly simple technique that's inspired by Bayesian techniques, but it's actually not rigorously uh, Bayesian. And it can be used with a wide variety of models, including stochastic models. This is why we're, uh, we show it within this picture, uh, approximate Bayesian computation allowing us to handle deterministic systems, systems which each time you run them, they give the same values, or or systems which are are, are um, stochastic, which evolve through randomness over time. That's what stochastics refers to. Um, another technique, which is more rigorously probabilistic and, and can be used rigorously Bayesian is, is also sampling from that perimeter distribution, but in a fully Bayesian way, it involves positing a certain prior distribution, a distribution of our assessment of what, what distribution in the absence of data, what we think might be plausible. Often that prior is quickly washed out by the, once we start having data, you know, our, we may uh, impose different priors, but really what, what determines what we arrive at for the posterior, the, the, the assessment of what values of parameters are really likely given the data really doesn't hinge very much on the on the priors. They're, they're, it's washed out by the strength of the data. In MCMC, um, Markov chain Monte Carlo is this rigorous way of estimating the values of the parameters. And um, it's a very simple algorithm conceptually. Um, it involves trying different parameter values. Um, Computing for each a relative value of the posterior distribution based on a likelihood functions, based on the likelihood given value of those parameters, a given vector of parameter values that we'd observe the, the data that's seen from the world. And, and then trying other parameter values, um, often gained by just tweaking the perimeter values we're trying now, trying them. And, and for each one, we either accept or reject. If we reject, we just reissue where we are now in space, our current location and parameter space. If we accept a candidate, then we admit that and we go there. And we sort of hop in this area of parameter space. And it's called Markov chain because at any one point, we're at a certain point in parameter space. If we reject a new candidate because it's got too low a posterior value relative to this one, which we flip a coin, and if it has a really low parameter value, we if this is where if this is where we are right uh, right now, 
and we flip a and we draw a new candidate. And if it's higher one, we always go down. Uh, if it's a lower, and so so this curve is showing the 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 uh, um, posterior uh, likelihood that we're we're being we're, we're sampling for it. If if this new one is higher than us, and the likelihood of observing the empirical data given the candidate compared to how well we can, how was, how likely it is with our current best guess, uh, then we go to that candidate. If by contrast, the new candidate shows it's a real dog, it shows you know really low likelihood of explaining the data, we only go with, with a fraction of a chance. So, so if it's only 25% as likely as the current one, we will uh, we'll only go with 25% probability. So we we wander over the space. And in general, this is a multidimensional space. Adjusting possible interpretations of the data, different possible parameter values, trying them out, and either staying where we are if, we're, if those aren't very good um, and, and emitting ours again, and therefore having many of those samples if we're at a really good point, or accepting them and going down. Um, and it turns out this works really well for sampling from, in other words, drawing values from this distribution. We can't draw the distribution. This, sh this shows a conceptual schematic view, but in general, we can't draw it. But at any given point, we can assess using the likelihood in the, post in the prior distribution, the, the probability of it. So we this provides us this way of sort of drawing samples from a plausible of, of values of parameters. And we draw lots of samples from the ones that are more likely <clears throat> according to how likely they are <laughs> and few from the, from the ones that are less likely. So those are techniques for estimating parameters here, and forgive me, um, and these are techniques like MCMC for deterministic systems, approximate Bayesian computation, and calibration for either stochastic or deterministic ones, so we're both. But now we're going to talk about a different problem. It's, it's, not, it's not that it has no relevance for parameter estimation, but really it's not meant, these next two, for for wholesale uh, estimation of parameters, you can kind of do them by having parameters vary over time and so on. But really what it's focused on is a different problem. It's on latent state inference. Oh man, you say, okay, what, what's that all about? Maybe you have a some sense what it means to estimate a contact rate or you know, a recovery time, a parameter. What does it mean to infer latent state? What it's about is, in my view, I'm gonna, Put it in words. It's about being humble as modelers, recognizing that when we have models of the world, we're often dealing with the world that's stochastic, and we're dealing with models of it that reflect those stochastics. Different things can happen, and it may be a fool's errand to give a definitive, you know, belief about what's going to play out. If we believe hard that this is going to happen, we may, in most cases, be disappointed. We have to be adaptive. We have to recognize that many things can happen. Um, you know, um, there could be an outbreak or not. Um, and the exact number of cases we see over time, for example, yes, it may be pretty well approximated by our model, but but you know, we may see a larger number of cases early or a larger number of cases later due to happenstance, due to chance. Um, wrong person went on the wrong flight and infected, you know, a, a new group of people or what have you. And in this notion of latent state inference, we're trying to understand over time in these systems which have some variability How, how, what, what is the situation right now in light of the data that we've observed? When I say what's the situation right now, I mean, what's the state of the system? Because it could have evolved in different directions. We're trying to estimate how is it actually evolved? 
in light of model structure, but recognizing that something the model thought was low likely it may have actually come about. And the model may have some gaps in its understanding of how things will evolve. And we want to adapt to that. We want to bear with it. We want to recognize that the model is not perfect. The data from the world are not perfect. The model is not perfect. And cut some slack and, and be, recognize, be willing to recognize that sometimes we're off base. We didn't think we'd end up here, but we sure is better get with the program and understand where we're at so we can look forward. So we may not have thought we'd be likely to end up in this situation, but we need to take into account the fact that that's the hand nature has dealt with us. And let's estimate the current state of the model in light of that so we can at least give good estimates going forward, assess trade-offs going forward for the model. Because otherwise our, our model will get more and more updated. The oldest contributions, in fact, are central to our lives. I suspect that in the 394, 858 class, there's not a single one amongst us who has not used a GPS system before. And many of us, probably most of us, have flown, for example, um, uh, in planes, as I did before I got in at 2 a.m. this morning here in Boston. Planes. GPS systems. Unfortunately, the, the technologies of conflict, of war, too many of them. Um, but many systems that operate in the world, autonomous vehicles, et cetera, they make central use of this common filter. Um, common filter basically takes uh, measurements from the world, um, some estimates from the model, and it weighs them and recognizes the model's not perfect. These measurements from the world are not perfect. And it uses assessments to try to estimate how uncertain is the model's estimate? How, how, much, how much do we want to really trust the model or, or not? And in measurements from the world, how reliable are they? And it takes us into account in something called a gain matrix, which is, is basically going to let us put more emphasis on measurements or more emphasis on the model, but then it blends them. So, so it may trust the estimates from the world, you know, um, a little bit more than the model, but it creates a, a best guess, a consensus guess that combines estimation from the model, from where the model thought we'd be. Imagine a plane, projecting forward based on its previous GPS measurements um, and based on the thrust of the engines and the, the wind speed outside and all these areas where its altitude, where it thinks it will be right now. And then a new measurement come in from GPS, which as we know is noisy, it's uncertain. And it, it takes both into account, those measurements from the world, and that's not perfect. This estimate from the model, that ain't perfect. And it combines them into a best guess. And then new measurements come in yet, yeah, and it adjusts that guess. So these guesses reflect not just the latest measurement, but our updated understanding based on past measurements. So they're not putting all their weight in any one, not putting all their eggs in any one basket. Not the latest measurement only. No, we're taking account previous measurements uh, in general in the process and not putting it all in the model. We're balancing. And it's a very lightweight process. It can be computed trivially on your phone or, or you know, very, very quickly in spacecraft or, or you know, airplanes, et cetera. Um, even with very simple computers, you can, you can perform this process. It's a recursive process. Our updates now reflect our updates from before and the impact of, of new measurements. And there's some beautiful mathematics behind it, but they depend on the system to be linear or linearized around a given, given point. Sort of reflect the fact that the system may be nonlinear in general, I mean, S times I, but around this point 
we have a pretty good linear approximation given given the current state for the next for the for the local area. Just like if you look in at a curve that's bent, you zoom in on any one piece of it, it looks like a straight line. And we using that model, we take what's called the Jacobian, which basically is is, is used to compute its its linearization. And we're weighing with this weighting matrix, how uncertain we are in the measurements, how uncertain we are in the, in the um, model. And it can do a pretty good job for, particularly for linear systems, systems that are pretty well described by linear observations. But there, we're dealing with today's issues, climate models with with uh, uh, models for communicable diseases, models uh, associated with things like intimate partner violence or domestic violence, um, models associated with uh, you know spread of uh, spread of of adverse body images or models associated with uh, with uh, self harm with very nonlinear systems um, where it can go in different directions. And Coleman filter can get really confused. It can think it's in one basin of attraction, it's actually in the other, and it's linearizing in this other basin of attraction. It's totally up to lunch. Um, it's like a robot trying to navigate, you know, based on its understanding of a map. And it's actually in the it thinks it's in a different area of the, the house than it really is. And it's going to be bumping into walls and doing all sorts of silly things, um, trying to take a door that doesn't exist in that room. So we need more sophisticated methods. And uh, our workhorse for these, and our labs are world leader in these, have been particle filtering and sequential Monte Carlo methods. And these methods helped guide 17 different jurisdictions during the pandemic, day to day or week to week. In some cases for First Nations reserves, uh, weekly or, or biweekly. And, and here we make use of a, of, a, of a more powerful set of methods that don't require linearization. They don't even require a model that's 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 formulated in differential equations. No, 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 no. Um, we can make use of it with stochastic models, uh, in principle with ABMs. And the models we made use of here, you know, they, they take a wide variety of observations, including classic ones like cases, et cetera. But also it could be things like social media posts, or it could be things like, like search volumes online. And we have some contribution showing how if you couple health system data with those things, it can really improve your accuracy. I know it's low quality data, but when you combine it with high quality data in a savvy way, you can do much, much better. And then you could just with high quality data, believe it or not. But we also have made use of wastewater data, which um, is incredibly valuable and which our TA Wade is a, is a real expert in. Now, using this sort of setup, you, you learn over time for observations from the system. You're taking into account your model, your model structure. It knows, you know, the characteristic stages of measles or pertussis or of RSV or of flu or of COVID-19 or what have you. And you have these observations in the world. It knows people don't, you know, uh, not all people with COVID-19 are symptomatic and get reported easily. And those, you know, uh, some people with, most people with pertussis do not go to the hospital, but maybe in babies, it's it's particularly likely to lead to, to high risks of hospitalization. Whatever um, features of a of, of particular infection, it might take into account um, through the theory. But it's taking into account these observations. It's recognizing a the theory isn't perfect. The observations aren't perfect. And we use likelihood functions to ask, what's, what's the likelihood we would have observed all these different measurements right now, those that are the subset that are available right now, if, we, if the actual situation were this or that or that or that. 
and here we're we're not sampling from parameters. Remember before we used this term theta to mean the parameter values, the values of of these observed of these parameters like contact rate, recovery time, mean time to lose immunity, what have you. We're not estimating those here. That was that was parameter estimation. We'll come back to that together with this, but but not now. What we're estimating here is the underlying state of that model. That's depicted X, the state, the, the current state, right? The values of the stocks, if it's a compartmental model, right? In light of the observed data, take into account that weird things happen. Outbreaks occur when you didn't think they would, but now you got to deal with that fact. You got to, again, get with the program. Recognize things did not turn out as the model might have thought most likely but we deal with the hand that nature has dealt with us, not as we'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. um, this too is performed recursively. And so it can be done very, very uh, effectively. Um, during, during the normal time between observations, the model just kind of runs forward, but it's run forward with at least thousands I mean, we've done it for hundreds, but it's, it's it's quite fraught with that. You want at least thousands, often tens of thousands. And for our work, routinely hundreds of thousands of alternative hypotheses for what the current situation is. Think of this swarm of different hypotheses, some outlandishly pessimistic, some very optimistic about the current situation. They're each called a particle, and they can... Each of them has a complete hypothesis about the current situation. That is the current state of the model. You have one number for susceptible, not one number for, for exposed but not yet infective, one number for infectives, one number for asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic or prosymptomatic individuals. People are not fully symptomatic. Complete state, one number for every stock in your model. We have particles. We have hundreds of thousands of them competing, jousting, vying to explain the data. These represent competing hypotheses for what's going on. But we don't trust all of them equally. We trust the ones that can explain well. And, and they have a, a measure of credibility that they build up called their weight. Okay, So they have this weight, W E. E-I-G-H-T, um, this weight. And the weight reflects their sort of relative credibility. And if, if they're explaining time after time the observations quite well, their weight is going to go up relative to other particles. If they're explaining it really poorly, they're, they're giving estimates of what we should see from the world that are just at variance with what you see, their weight gets downgraded. It gets multiplied by the likelihood function and then renormalized. And so how that happens. So they explain right now these latest data with uh, it's high likelihood, it, they're up weighted relative to the others or down weighted. And there's this survival of the fittest of these particles. They joust, they compete to explain things. And that updating of weights and the survival of fittest is mediated when we see new observations. Between those time, all the particles run forward according to the normal rules of the model. So they then run forward. And we have some system noise in this model. We have some stochastics that are driving it. So with traditional calibration, if you feed in, uh, in secret, uh, if you feed in you know, observed data and you try to calibrate it, a model to it with a certain structure, a compartmental model, you'll get a best fit. It it tries really hard. It's working, it's working, trying to get the single estimate for the parameters that best matches the data. But often it it's quite at variance. And the more data you go, the more time, you know, if this was your best estimate, you know, you're just not gonna be explaining these twists and curves of, of, of the epi curve of this observations over time. That's what you get with traditional calibration. You get the single parameter values that best match, but it doesn't bear with the situation. It doesn't say, oh, 
gosh, there's this really big outbreak uh, that, that seems to be starting. I'm going to take that into account in my new estimates that, uh, okay, I may have thought it was going to be, you know, uh, a lull at this point, but I've got a really big estimate. I'll take into account. No, no, calibration doesn't do that. It's just, it's like the single best estimate of the parameters based on the data we accorded with. With particle filtering, these techniques, you nail it, you nail it, you nail it. It learns where we are and and can then predict, predict forward. Is there going to be an outbreak? Uh, how big will it be? Really well. And you can estimate things like for different childhood groups or uh, adults. In some cases, you can do really, really well for predicting forward, you know, where where we're at. And so, you know, maybe we've observed this. And again, any one particle might have thought it's different. But remember, we're we're putting our emphasis on those particles that are competitive, that are that are explaining things really well right now. And so it's fostering this this savviness about where we're at. And then based on whatever we've seen recently, maybe it's low number of cases, we can predict forward and anticipate an outbreak, anticipate an outbreak here. Because we know, well, lots of susceptibles, those particles that are savvy, the smart money is with, you know, with uh, those that are positing large number of susceptibles have been built up. All the particles that predicted low cases, low, case, low cases, they're having larger and larger number of susceptibles accumulating and accumulating because the outflow is less than the inflow. New babies are arriving measles uh, and, and young kids it's accumulated and we're not getting many infections and as they're building up and then looking forward to saying there's a bad moon arising there's trouble on the way um, and lo and behold it it can predict it very well we can do this for for communicable diseases uh, such as measles and pertussis this in, in pre-vaccination data very 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 well Now, you may remember that we said earlier that we have these two, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back just so we could see that curve. Um, apologies. So we, we dealt with common filtering. Quite good. It, we've used all of it. Uh, overall, very good with linear systems, but can be a dog if you have a serious non-linearity. It can be really poor. Shouldn't play down canine companionship. It can be really poor when you're doing it. Particle filtering is able to handle these nonlinear systems really well. It's much more savvy. We can earn these hundreds of thousands of interpretations and, and have um, this understanding, taking into account all these different types of data without counting on a certain model form, without counting like Coleman filtering does that the data is, is, is characterized by a, a normal distribution, that it's Gaussian distributed for those for whom that's a... a meaningful uh, term. Particle filtering, though, ultimately is a latent state inference techniques, a technique. And if you want to do both parameter inference and latent state techniques, you're looking at using something like particle Markov chain Monte Carlo, which combines the best of Markov chain Monte Carlo with particle filtering. And here we can have a, a similar um, uh, model, but we're estimating both the parameters, that's the theta, and the underlying model state, given the model, but in light of data. Um, it's really expensive. It's orders of magnitude more expensive than particle filtering. But it's really powerful for allowing you to estimate parameter values jointly with, at the same time, with model state. So. If you think this parameter set is more likely. This value of the contact rate, the transmission probability, the recovery time, then that implies an interpretation of the underlying state like this. If by contrast, you think these other parameters are more likely, it implies this interpretation. So you get the savviness also in terms of per possible parameter interpretations and in terms of the underlying state in light of the data and the model that is capturing your, your theory. And it's interpreting this data in an integrated way, giving a, an integrated picture 
a theory for what's going on in the world that jibes with your your best guesses as you know the stages of COVID nineteen or or stages of depression or or what have you. Um, and it jibes with all this different data that you're observing. So you're interpreting the data as different faces of an underlying system. And you're getting this integrated picture, almost like a, a 3D CAT scan of what's going on, not in the body, but in this, in this situation in the world that accords with all the data, makes sense of, of this data is the idea that that gives this integrated picture that takes all that data into account and gives a single and gives this distribution of possibilities for what's going on in the world there. Okay, I want to talk though. I've been, you know, referring to these techniques predominantly with more traditional forms of data. But I did slip in a reference there to areas of data that are central to our work, components of big data. And indeed, my lab has been responsible for for helping to envision and then to, to roll out and, and co-create um, uh, these systems for collecting big data, like on smartphones and wearables for the uh, Ethica or Evicenter program uh, uh, system or from Evicenter Research or uh, or uh, data from social media or, or uh, search volumes online. I want to talk about big data. Um, uh, big data is a term that's been overhyped and it's been used. And, and um, uh, I think um, we all have some sense that these highly available electronic data sources um, that increasingly surround us, um, whether it's web logs or Reddit posts or, or, or Twitter, which Elon Musk wants people to refer to as X, um, uh, or or Instagram posts, or you know, um, uh, data related to uh, from accelerometers on phones, that it provides data at a at a big scale that's different from you know the sort of data that's gathered by StatsCan surveys traditionally, for example. And there's a lot of bad definitions of big data, but the one I'm I find least problematic is the four Bs. And I mentioned them earlier. It's high volume, that's the big in big data, but it's more notably, it's high velocity. It comes in very quickly often. Think about posts on Instagram, your Instagram feed, or think about data from accelerometry or GPS compared to you know, traditional surveys where maybe you're, you, you fill out a, a census form once a short form census once a year or what have you. Uh, you get called to to pull you. Um, it has high variety. Often, you know, a smartphone or, or Evicenter program, uh, Evicenter research pro platform collects dozens of sensor types um, for studies that wish to enable them uh, for for people who are fully consenting to that information. Um, and that's high variety from the same person. You might collect something about their physical activity, where they are potentially who they're with uh, uh, and, and information uh, potentially also about um, how they're feeling, et cetera, through, through surveys um, delivered on the phone. And then you have, uh, in many cases, high veracity for certain things like reporting weight or reporting um, uh, nutritional intake or reporting physical activity uh, or, or locations or, or contact patterns. Uh, when it's enabled with Bluetooth beacons and so on, um, you get a much a more accurate picture than through self-report traditionally. Um, and uh, you know, even even some publicly available data sources uh, can be very eye-opening. Things like Google Trends, right? Looking at reports with Lyme disease, uh, this tick-borne uh, illness, uh, and and rashes um, and their correlation, or or search during the 2009, 2010, H1N1 pandemic um, uh, and COVID-19 posts on, on social media. Um, 
Uh, this is Ethica, now FS Center Research, uh, collecting data from smartphones, from multiple types of, of smartphones and, and collecting um, via a, a web-based app. Um, uh, in some cases, we have things like GPS and, and uh, Bluetooth records and, and um, activity records, again, all from consulting individuals. People have agreed because they, they're made very given very detailed awareness of what's being collected and often um uh and where we can also route them surveys um in some cases we take screenshots we ask them to take screenshots of certain information on their phone that provides us understanding of their app use and uh, we have a fantastic student of our lab marvi Balak, who created this whole analysis pipeline for screenshots based on on collected information um and we can use wearable technologies along with this and get understanding of like where contacts are taking place or how contacts shift in, in light of risk perception during a pandemic and capturing understanding of circulation of people and where in Houston people might be encountering tobacco related billboards that might influence their smoking behaviors. And we can couple these in a natural way with, for example, um, uh, models of, of transmission. And I'm going to go light here, but one of the things we find is that when we inform models with more detailed data, with this big data, often we can anticipate how thing, the burden of, of infections or where things will go um, with greater accuracy. We can better assess what's really going on in some ways, night and day differences with very aggregate high level traditional data. And sometimes the extra frequency of sampling really, really matters. I'm gonna switch uh, though to uh, another technique, one that's particularly um, powerful when coupled with big data. And that is techniques for arriving at some understanding of causal influences in a system. When we have these systems in the world, um, we, We will commonly have them be coupled. I've spoken to you about this before in the classroom. In those precious times and much valued times when we were able to be together. And we talked about how when we're dealing with these systems, maybe it's an agent-based model um, or, uh, or maybe it's model of SIRS or what have you. The very form of the model helps communicate just how coupled it is. Someone's likelihood of being infected in the next little bit depends on the number of susceptibles and the number of infectives and the number of recovered. It would be a fit of madness to try to anticipate how the number of recovered people uh, is going to change over time if you, without being aware of the number of infectives and, and indeed the number of uh, susceptibles. And similarly, if you want to predict how number of infectives will go, you're not gonna be able to do that without reason about the number of susceptibles. Because if there's a ton more susceptibles, you may get many more infectives. If all the susceptibles are depleted, there might have very few new infections. So we have these couplets in our models. But so it is with the world. Those couplings in our models reflect the coupled nature of the world, that things impact each other across the system. What goes on in a physician's office in prescribing opioids for chronic pain pops out in emergency departments. It pops out in the hospital wards. It pops out in police calls for overdoses or EMS calls to help deal with overdoses. And what goes on in terms of corrections and helping people who have substance issues, who are incarcerated, um, overcome their substance issues and be more fully rehabilitated matters in terms of the number of people seeking opioids uh, through doctor shopping from, from seeking opioids who, who really uh, are not using them for legitimate purposes. But the coupled nature of these things in the world mean that the data we're receiving from any one piece of the world is entangled with others. We saw that earlier um, in those earlier slides. And 
I spoke with you about how Tinkins and Benning theorem described how when you take a given observation, type of observation from the world, a given you know, type, maybe it's number of cases, maybe it's the number of EMS calls for overdoses, maybe it's the number of, of, of overdoses or near overdoses encountered in the emergency room on a, on a per week basis for the last five years. Um, if you take that particular type of data and you were to systematically use it for each data point, except those at the very beginning, um, use it to reconstruct vectors where the vectors have as values the current value, the value a certain amount of time ago, the value two times that amount of time ago, et cetera. We, we create what's called delay embedding. That's what this is. Um, then we can reconstruct this state space. And, and one of the uses of this, uh, it has many uses, and, and these somehow it's not, it, it somehow got cut off, and I apologize, but um, uh, it allows us to, here we go, um, recognize hidden order behind it, see these patterns in it we wouldn't have otherwise seen, visually assess dimensionality or connectedness, clues to us how complicated a model, sophisticated model, how, how many state variables we need to, to characterize this. You can give clues there. Um, but it can also allow us to assess which types of factors in the world are likely to be driving others. Our TA Wade is, is uh, quite an expert in this. And basically, uh, you can, by performing tests using data from the world, um, you can distinguish cases where two things are merely statistically uh, dependent, merely statistically covarying. One's higher when the other's higher, one's lower when the other's lower, or, or they're, they're going in opposite for either causal reasons, one's you know, X is influencing Y, or is it because Y is influencing X, or is it because some other factor, say Z, is influencing both of them, and neither of them is driving the other? We can we can start to distinguish these things, and this is called convergent cross mapping, another tool of systems data science. One of the tools we're most excited about, which is 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 newer but showing great promise, is techniques based on, on deep learning. These are techniques which um, have very flexible structures uh, based on many layers of a what's called a neural network. It's inspired by neurons and in, in systems in the world. It, um, it has connectivity patterns, which we pre-specify in terms of its layers. So it's not totally without any assumptions. Um, but it's a very, very flexible instrument in the sense that it doesn't believe hard any one theory. And it's an instrument for learning, learning to match patterns in data. And the idea is that over time, you train this model and you adjust the weights going between pairs of neurons here. You adjust the weights over time to get it to best accord with data. And by adjusting those weights and adjusting those weights and adjusting those weights, you get it to better and better accord with the data. And by doing this, you can get it to match, reproduce these patterns, these relationships in the world statistically, these associations. Um, but when we do this absent causality, um, we may capture a certain association, but we don't know what direction the causality is, is coming. Um, and it's much more effective, uh, much more, much more powerful if we can do causal prediction. And this is what a new generation of AI and deep learning approaches promise. It's this ability to assess the situation in ways that gives us a savvy understanding of what's driving what what's called causal prediction. And this is getting close to the types of models we've talked about in this class. Um, 
And uh, indeed, there's this whole sphere of model structural inference towards inferring the types of equations or the types of posited structure we have put into our models. In this class, we've emphasized describing those structures based on theory. But increasingly, the science is pointing to opportunities to try to derive these automatically from rich data sources. And finding even sort of the natural coordinate systems, natural state variables for, for describing these systems. Um, so using, using techniques of deep learning and adjusting so that it best matches certain output, and I'm gonna have to finish up here uh, very soon, so I'm, I'm skipping over this. We can find sort of reduced dimensionality descriptions using techniques like autoencoders. We have some data from the world and we want to capture the patterns in it in a much more minimal way, reduced dimensional representation. Capture the essential features of that system's behavior over time, but with few state variables, with, with as parsimonious a way of describing it as possible. And I provided some links here, which I will post. And it turns out that increasingly there's this understanding of how to build up these network architectures to capture these sort of patterns. Um, and we're increasingly learning how to take into account causality. So I'm gonna end my, my uh, slide with, my, my lecture with this slide. Um, as traditionally practiced, data science and system science have been traditionally pursued largely as solitudes. Um, each of them is, is incredibly powerful computational way um, to describe things in the world, um, to, to inform um, our understanding of the world. Um, but there's key shortcomings that limit the, the potential. And I believe these are not only complementary, but synergistic. Um, uh, systems data science offers these techniques, uh, this combination of techniques of understanding data from the world, not in isolation, not in a fragmented way, but it's different aspects of common underlying systems. And informing our understanding of those systems, not through imposed always pre-existing theory, but ways of working towards informing that theory, making that theory more, more savvy, more in accordance with the data, um, more powerful, um, more explicative. We can use these techniques of systems data science um, to open up new vistas in the types of approaches we've learned in this class, to keep models always consistent with observed data, to clue us in when we need to change model structural assumptions, we change model structure, and to give us understanding of, of what state a model is in, even when it didn't accord with our original understanding of where it was likely to be. This enterprise of systems data science um, gives us this understanding that like the models this semester can reason about cases we've never seen, including effects of interventions and learn far deeper and faster from evidence um, and recognize how what we see in the world is a reflection of a common system and see how interventions in the world affect the system as a whole. And it gives us common picture of evidence drawn from different areas of the world and really helps us understand how our decisions might affect the world in a way that is savvy to all this data that is, that is coming in over time um, as, as reported through elements of big data as well as more traditional aspects um, and give us increasingly clues for what how our models can be more well suited for describing that data through techniques such as structural inference. So ladies and gentlemen, it is with those words that I will conclude this lecture. And then indeed, I will conclude this class. Um, it's been my great pleasure uh, and honor to, to be with you this semester. Um, I know we're not quite done. 
Those work in projects have some time still, and I'll try to work with you for that, try to be available for meetings for those purposes. Those working on assignments, um, uh, we have a couple days uh, that we can accommodate, but normally they're due tomorrow and, and on Sunday we'll, um, you know, we really need them, uh, the, the assignments by Sunday. Um, I look forward to being with you at the, uh, at the review session. But I hope that what we've covered in this class opens up for you some awareness in the ways in which these methods of computational significance can help inform decision-making, action in the world and help bend the world for the better, um, help us behave in ways that are more savvy and less um, and less uh, short change and short-sighted. Um, those interested in going further with any of these techniques, I'm always glad to, to talk. We have boot camps over the summer, hackathons applying these techniques. And indeed, U of S is a center of teaching for this sort of work through my efforts, uh, which have been you know, given rise to dozens and dozens of events worldwide. Um, those seeking on the curricular front to learn more of relevance, uh, I will. Uh, if people are really interested in in these uh, in these events, please be in contact, and we'll try to accommodate. Yes, um, we will look for you know volunteers and people who can work on projects. Um, there's opportunities for for uh, learning more also curricularly. I'm, I'm in a, a tighter financial situation now, but uh, you know I, I'm hoping for uh, funding to come in, which might allow for hiring grad students down down the road additionally. Um, but right now is is particularly tight. I will note that uh, uh, if you're interested in applying these sort of tools in a way relevant for uh, software development, my course next term, CMPT 371, um, has uh, opportunities for learning about principles of software project management and software application where the lessons of this course come up um, and for practical, um, uh, practical examination in the context of the dynamical systems uh, that, that apply centrally in software development. Um, so it's really been um, a, a, a difficult semester for all of us, and I so appreciate you bearing with all those difficulties. Uh, I will hold some office hours next week. Um, I can't promise yet that they'll be at the normal times. So I, I, um, uh, I, I will have to plan that out in my calendar, but I will have uh, will have some space, and I particularly will project. Uh, will will. Um, prioritize projects that are still underway uh, for, for discussion. Thank you so much. And yes, the review session will be online. I'll be posting, posting some slides. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop this recording.